It's very nice to be in Budapest, beautiful city. And I want to congratulate you for the conference. I'm very impressed. And uh, Dario, great presentation. Very practical. Very nice. I like that. It's very important, the sports science, but the practical application is what we need as coaches. Um, OK, so my topic today is important principles for effective coaching. Um, what I want to share with you is my, first of all, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to share with you my journey so far, my tennis journey, which I think has been quite interesting, because a lot of young coaches now here, I think, looking to see where they're going to go with their careers. And then what I want to do is share you with you some things that I've learned along the way that I think are very important for people to improve the effectiveness of their coaching. I'm going to touch on some methodology. I'm going to touch on communication. I'm going to touch on organization of group sessions. I'm going to show some exercise related to very high performance and some that are related to uh, recreational players as well, or beginner players. But all of these things are the glue that holds coaching together. So c methodology, communication, organization, and helps to accelerate the learning of the player. And I know this conference is about 12 and under, 14 and under, so I'll be touching a lot on that. So I'm from a, an Irish tennis family, OK? My, my grandfather, believe it or not, he played at Wimbledon in 1927. And he was the first Davis Cup captain of Ireland in 1923, OK? So I grew up in tennis. I was a, a pretty good player in Ireland. I played international for Ireland. And eventually, I got a scholarship to the US. I played college tennis in the US. And then I played the low-level professional. I played satellites pretty badly, I have to say. But I played satellites. And I realized I was never going to make any money playing. But in my last year in university, in Ireland, I, was, I spent six years in university. Uh, my main objective was not to get a job. That's why I was in university. And I was making so much money in my last year coaching tennis that when I finished, I decided to stay in the business of tennis. It was OK. And I then got into coaching. And I call this period my period of breaking rocks. I coached in the wind, in the rain. I coached beginner players. I coached advanced players. And I started to learn about coaching because I didn't know too much. I ran my own summer camp with residential camp. And I, I just got into the business of tennis. But I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn more about coaching. And back in 1985, I went to the first European Coaches Symposium for me. And you won't believe, that's me. I know they, they don't make legs like this anymore, but that's me at the Worldwide Coaches Conference in 87 with a beard. I'm a little younger. I know not much younger, but. Um, and at that time, the Swedish and the Germans were dominating tennis. And what I did at those conferences, I wanted to know everything the Swedes were doing. How often they went to the toilet, what they ate, how much they slept. I wanted to know everything that was making them successful. Afterwards, I went to Bostad to the training center, and I saw how they were working with their best players in Sweden, and they had very good players there at the time. So I was learning, like you guys are here. You come here to learn. And it's not just about the presentations. It's about speaking to other coaches that you respect and finding out more about how you can improve your coaching. Later in my career, I moved to the UK, and I owned my own indoor tennis and fitness center. Six indoor courts, 30 people working for me, and a team of about seven coaches. And this was a very nice experience. We had some success with some junior players who went on to become top 200, ATP, WTA, so pretty good. And in 91, I joined the ITF. So I was very fortunate to work for the International Tennis Federation for 25 years. Nelson Mandela and I, we both escaped after 24 year, 25 years. So I was 25 years, and I, I, I resigned after 25 years. But it was a great experience. I traveled to over 140 nations. And 
got to meet some very interesting people. People ask me, did I meet famous people like Djokovic or Nadal? No, I met SpongeBob. This was good for me, very famous. And I also got invited to some very important tennis events. We had a training center in Fiji, in Fiji in the Pacific, and I set up the center. And one time when I visited, I was invited to a very important event. The mayor of Latoka invited me to the opening of the public toilets. This was a fantastic experience for me, and I never forget it. So I was invited, and I was the official guest at the opening of the public toilet. So I did some very good things. OK, I got to, in the ITF, I got to oversee the, the touring team program, and we helped a lot of players who went on to become very good players. So I learned a lot about the scheduling of players like Jarko Neiman and Marcus Bagdadis, Tipsarevich, Azarenka. So I learned a lot there. I was the person who set up the play and stay campaign for the ITF, which was trying to get tennis to increase participation. And I'll talk about this later on, but the great thing was it led to the change in the rules for 10 and under. And we launched Tennis Express and also a rating. So I'll talk about some of this stuff later on, but I, I think I know a reasonable amount about participation. Coaches education, I was very involved with the, with the ITF and we set up the Coaching and Sports Science Review, and also the iCoach, which I hope some of you are members of. It's a very nice tool. And was involved in many conferences, including the Worldwide Coaches Conference, which during the time I was at the ITF went from 100 coaches to 850 coaches from over 100 nations. The main thing was I got to work with some really experienced coaches, both male and female. And I learned a lot. Now, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up, but I love working in tennis. I don't feel I ever worked because it's something I love, and I hope you guys feel the same. If you have a passion, it doesn't feel like work. And I believe that tennis is the best sport, but I'm going to talk about that in a moment. I now, I took a year off, but now I work with the Asian Tennis Federation 50% of my time. And I, I like Asia because what's happening in Asia is participation's going up and high performance as well. And now there's five men in the top 100 and nine women in the top 100. And a lot of players like this boy from China who won US Open juniors recently, he's very physically strong and I think he's gonna be top 10 in the world in the next three or four years. So let's start with some principles. I'm going to show you some things today, first in the lecture room here, but I'm going to show some practical things. But later on on the court with some good players, I want to apply the principles in a practical way. But a lot of them are very simple and practical because I believe that the obvious is often the greatest secret. Let's start with what I call the circle theory, a circle theory. And I I'm going to compare tennis coaching to an artist, okay, an artist, a painter. So when somebody starts painting, usually they're very simple. The same way with coaching. When people finish playing and they start coaching, usually they're very simple in their coaching because they know very little. As they go through their career, there's a moment usually when they know a lot. And sometimes when you know a lot, know a lot, you get very complicated. So you start talking about, is it 76 degrees or 78 degrees and the angle of the racket, and it's quite complicated. Same with painters. They start being very complicated. But the most effective time is when you have lots of knowledge, but you use it in a very simple and practical way. And that's why Picasso, at the end of his career, he could have painted very complicated, but he painted very simple. And they were the masterpieces. So when we coach, it's good to have the knowledge, like Dario has incredible knowledge about physical conditioning, but he's applying it in a very practical and simple way. When I attend Grand Slams with some really top coaches that used to work with the ITF, when we watch matches together, what I hear from these top coaches is, 
He needs to hit cross court more. Needs to get his first serve in more. He needs to be, or she needs to be up the court a bit more. They need to hit cross court and down the line to move the player. Simple and practical stuff. They need to use their legs more on the serve. So this is the experience coaches use practical and simple things, not complicated. Theory versus practice. What's the difference between the theory and the practice? I had the chance to, to be at a conference about 10 years ago with a guy called Rick Charlesworth, a very talented coach of hockey. He won the gold medal for Australia in two Olympic games. He was the coach. And he gave a, a presentation and made, and he was also, by the way, a medical doctor, very talented guy. He, was, he trained as a surgeon. So he gave this example, which I use a lot, which is, when you learn to be a surgeon, the heart, everything is in different colors, the theory. So you can see the, this, the aorta is in red, the atrium is in purple, everything's different colors. The problem is, when you open up a person, everything is red. Everything is red, and that's the difference. Now, in coaching, yes, we plan for, we plan to have eight players, but we have nine. We plan to have two courts, but we only have one. We think the weather's going to be good, but it rains. That's the theory versus practice. And the only certainty is nothing goes exactly according to plan. And you need to be able to adapt and to make the sessions work when it does. It's good to plan. It's good to plan, but nothing goes exactly according to plan. Now, a question for everybody. This is going to be on the exam later, OK? This is going to be on the exam later. Be ready. Is tennis an easy sport or a difficult sport? Hands up who thinks it's easy sport. OK, how many people think it's a difficult sport? OK, how many pe people think soccer is an easy sport? Football. Football is an easy sport. OK. Difficult sport? OK. so. Let me show let me show a video, okay? Let me show a video. Whoops. Yeah. Serve, rally, and score in a small court. A red ball is used throughout. You will notice that no technical information is given during these short clips. However, the coach should introduce simple teaching points, but only if it will help the players to rally better within the step shot. These players were two ladies who work in the Bank of England club near the ITF. They had never played tennis, never. They had no instruction, and with a red ball, they were able to play. The point is that tennis is an easy game to play if you use the right ball. Let's take, is this tennis? Two kids playing, and they have to go keep a ball up, and then the other player hits a ball up, and then the other player hits a ball up. This is playing tennis. It's serve, rally, score. And the problem we have is that a lot of people, I asked this question at the ITF AGM with all of the presidents one time. All of the presidents said tennis is difficult, and all of the presidents said football is easy. What the truth is, is that tennis is easy to play, but difficult to play well. Soccer is easy to play, but very difficult to play well. The first day in football, the kids are playing and kicking and scoring. But of course, later they need to know to pass the ball. They need different technique. Now, the problem is that if all of you guys think tennis is a difficult game, you're the salespeople. And so it's like me trying to sell a car to Gabor. Gabor, I want you to buy this car, 
but look, it's difficult to drive and it's, it's, no. I want to sell the car saying, this is a great car, it drives really well. So we need to be good salespeople. So for me, tennis is easy to play and the balls are not just for kids. The balls are not just for kids. And that's why the play and stay campaign, the slogan was serve rally score. Hit it over, hit it back and play the point. This is interesting thing because I just want to touch on adults a little bit. I know that's not part of the program, but, but why do adults play tennis? Why do adults play tennis? Well, the research shows, because we did research a long time ago, like kids, they want fun. It's very difficult to define what fun is, but they want fun. Some of them, it, fun is just being with other people. Some is competing. They either want to play or they want to compete, so they like playing some sort of sport. They like the social. They want to be healthy. They want to feel that they're improving a bit. So that's why a rating is quite good, to make people feel that they're improving. But they also want to belong. They like the fact that, oh, Gabor, hi, how are you doing? Nice to see you again. Great you came back. They want to belong. But very important is they want to do their sport when it suits them. And that's why the gym, that's why cycling, that's why swimming is very popular because the adults can do it when it suits them. So we have to think about how we can adapt tennis to make sure the people can do it when it suits them. And this is something I'll talk about in a little while. Tennis needs to compare very well. So one of the things I think all of you know, a lot of people when they finish their other sports, they come to tennis. Nobody is going to learn soccer at 50. Nobody's going to learn basketball at 50, but a lot of people when they finish playing their sport, they come and play tennis. So the problem we have is that they come to tennis having played a very active and dynamic sport. They've been running, they've been playing and moving. And many times the first experience in tennis has been very static and very technical. And they don't get to move around, they don't get to play the game, and often they stop coming. And we were teaching tennis too much like, like ballet, artistic impression. 8.9, 8.95, it's beautiful, isn't it? But they can't play. So we need to make sure that our introduction of the sport is much more active and dynamic and involving playing the game. And that's where Tennis Express came about. And I, I think many of you know about it. And the best tennis drill, because you as coaches, you've seen so many drills. I'm going to show a lot of drills later on, but the best drill in tennis is Hit it over, hit it back, play the point. How do I know it's the best drill? How do I know this is the best drill? Because if I put two people doing this drill and I go away for half an hour, when I come back, they'll still be doing it. Why? Because it's, it's fun. They like playing the game. But before, many times, people had to wait a year of learning technique before they actually got to play the game. And so this whole thing of serve, rally, score, and now I'm gonna come to the game-based approach and methodology. So the, this is the most important drill, and all of your coaching, everything you do, technical, tactical, physical or mental instruction should be to help the players do this better. Very simple. So if I have two beginner players, and this is the fundamental thing of the game-based approach, because the game-based is misunderstood. So if I have two beginner players, 
And I'm trying to get them, they, they're rallying ground stroke, forehand, and they're only getting, their best score was five in a row, okay? But I want them to work on consistency. I want them to be able to hit more balls in a row. So maybe my instruction is try to hit the ball a little more in front and hit the ball a little bit higher. And because of that instruction, the players are able to get 10 or 15. Relevant instruction to help the player serve rally and score more effectively. Now, let's take Roger Federer. Roger Federer is playing Nadal. I need to think what instruction I can give Roger to be able to do better against Nadal. Maybe it's a combination of tactical and technical. So I say, Roger, you're going to have to slice Rafa out of the court and then get around and hit a big forehand. That's the tactic. So now we're going to work slice serve. We're going to work a lot on the slice serve before he plays Rafa. And then in the match, Roger can slice and get around and win the point a bit better. Relevant instruction to help Roger serve rally and score more effectively against Rafa. And this is the game-based approach. And what I see is often coaches giving instruction that doesn't help the player. It's not relevant to that player. Okay, today we're going to work on the drop shot. Maybe the player doesn't need the drop shot. This player needs to work on consistency. Now, later when I come on the court, you're going to see that when I organize a group of six players on a court, we're doing the same task. Let's say we're doing, we're doing baseline consistency. For this player, it might be, let's recover, recover your position. For this player, it might be get more racket speed. For every player, the instruction will be different in order for them to implement the task more effectively. Does that make sense to everybody? But everything is linked to playing the game. And if it doesn't help the player play the game better, you shouldn't be doing it. And I know this is very obvious, but this is what happens a lot in coaching. Okay, what's, <coughs> what's the role of the coach? What's your role as a coach? In my opinion, too many coaches think their principal role is to teach technique. And that's what they focus on a lot. And I know technique is very important. Technique's important, but it's only a tool. Technique is only a tool. The main role of the coach is to organize players to play. That's your job, organize them. Let, okay, you're gonna hit cross court to this player. This is what you're gonna do, here's the task. You're there, you're there, organize. Once you've organized, then your job is to give relevant instruction. Could be technical, could be tactical, could be physical, could be mental, to help them do that task better. And that's the job of the coach, organization. And in my opinion, many coaches are not very good at this organization of organizing people to play. Another observation for me, and this is for coaches who are working in, in clubs. When I, when I go into a club, almost everywhere in the world. I go in and I look at the notice board. And what I see on the notice board is everything about coaching. 10 and under coaching, group coaching, adult coaching, doubles coaching, singles coaching, everything. But I don't see very much about play. I don't see very much about here's all the tournaments, here's all the play, here's the, and for me, tennis has is being driven too much by coaching at the moment. I see kids around the world who only co get coaching. I ask them, you play tennis? Yeah, I, I do coaching on a Tuesday and a Thursday. When do you play? Oh, I don't play matches. No, I just do coaching. So this is the challenge. And I think coaches 
it doesn't have to be them doing the work, but one of the jobs in a club should be somebody organizing people to play and to compete. Now, what's the difference between play and competition? Anybody like to tell me the difference between tennis play and tennis competition? Any ideas? I'll tell you, okay. Because this is going to be on this, pardon? Oh, this is going to be on the exam. So tennis play is where we keep score. So Gabor and I play, we keep score, but nobody writes it down afterwards. Nobody says at the end that Gabor is better than me or that I'm better than him. And tennis play is like fun. It's nice. Okay, we're going to play, okay? Now we finish, I'm going to play you. But nobody's saying, I'm better than you and you're better than me. And a lot of people like this. It's nice. Tennis competition is where people play, keep score, but at the end, everybody knows that Gabor is better than Dave. And some people don't like this. And so for me in a club, we need to be organizing a lot more play where people keep score, and that's a lot more fun. Okay, so. Now, whoop, what's going on here? Get rid of that. Is that the, there's the TV, yeah. Okay. Everybody, I hope, knows that the rules of tennis changed a lot in the last 15 years. I'm very proud of the fact that I was pushing the rules of tennis committee to change the rules. So now you can play with the 10 and under, match tie breaks, best of three tie breaks, one short set, three short sets. You can even play time matches. In the rules of tennis, you can play a tournament with 20 minute matches, blow the whistle, and then they go to the next match. But not many people, I think, in clubs are using all of these formats. And for me, playing competition is like a product. It's like a product. And you have to adapt this product to the needs and lifestyles of the customer. And as we know, people have less time, and often the old system of competition doesn't attract people because they don't have the time to wait around for a whole week. But doing short matches can be very uh, uh, good in tennis. This is something I feel very strongly about. The green ball, everybody knows what the green ball is. 25% slower, okay. This ball is in the rules of tennis. This ball looks like a yellow ball. It looks like a yellow ball, it's just got a green dot. And you play on the full court. Let me ask you a question, how many clubs in Hungary are using this ball with adults at the recreational level? Nobody. But it's 25% easier. So this could help retention a lot by getting more people to play. So this is something I think needs to be done for, for the future. Okay, let's get to some methodology principles. Optimal challenge. So optimal challenge. When, when we set a task, so when we organize people to play tennis, we're setting tasks all the time. Okay, you're going to serve, you're going to come in and play the volley. It's a task. It's a drill. If the drill is too difficult, the players get frustrated and they lose confidence. If the task is too easy, they get bored. And our job is to ensure that the challenge is optimal. That every player in the, in the group is challenged. And that means that maybe one player, when we're doing cross-court forehands, is allowed to trap the ball and then hit it back. Another player is not allowed to do that. And maybe one player has to hit one forehand, one backhand. And now, the six players 
are doing the same task with different levels of difficulty, but everybody is challenged. Not too difficult, not too easy. Everybody understand? So I'm going to show this on the court, and you'll see it a lot this afternoon. Differentiation is a, an educationalist term, but all it means is just adapting. So adapting drills to ensure a challenge. And how do you adopt, how do you adapt drills? Well, you can make the court bigger or smaller. You can change the rules. No lobs allowed. So now the players can come in and they feel confident. You can change the scoring. You can change the scoring to say you get two points for winning at the net, one point for the baseline. You can change the drill to be cooperative. So, okay, let's see if we can get how many in a row. One, two, 10, 12, 15. We're working as a team or competing. I'm gonna try to beat you or a combination. We're gonna keep four shots and then we're gonna play the point. But these are all ways of adapting the exercise. Again, why? To make sure the people, it's not too difficult, not too easy. I said it yesterday during the, the session. I said a very important part of us, of our coaches is, and parents, is to help to build and maintain self-confidence. And it's very simple. You build and maintain self-confidence by making sure the task is appropriate, making sure the players get success, reasonable success, and then when they have success, you say positive things. Did you see Dario today? When the kids were, yes, many times positive reinforcement. I didn't see Dario do, today I didn't see him go, no, 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 stop, that was really bad. No, he, there were many times he saw that the kids were struggling with a task, but he made it a little bit easier, maybe showed them a little bit more, but when they did it well, positive. And that builds self-confidence. But too many coaches, they stop when the players do it wrong. Sometimes you have to. But the most powerful is when you stop when the player does it right. Now we come to performance versus outcome. So, coaches talk about this a lot. They say things like, we want our kids to perform well. The result is not so important. And it, it, it's true. Focusing on the performance is very, very good. And I'm going to show you a clip later on from Nadal that, that emphasizes that. But if you really want to do this, you have to show the kids that you are focusing on the performance. Let me give you an example. Supposing you're asking the kid, instead of finishing like this, you want them to finish a little higher. Okay? So the kid is like, okay, so you're feeding the ball and the kid is hitting, okay? And what you're doing is you're going, yep, no long. Now the, the kid realizes you're watching the outcome. What you have to do is be going, okay, you know, a little bit higher. How does that feel? And the, the, the kid sees you're watching the performance, not the outcome. And I'll apply this a lot outside, but for me, effort is the most important thing. You want to make sure that the kids are giving 100% effort at all times. Kids will have different talent. Some kids are fast, some kids are slow, some kids have good technique, but the most important thing is that everybody's working hard. And what I see is that too many times coaches are rewarding talent. So they go, oh wow, 
you're so good, that was really good. And because you're good and talented, he's beating everybody. Even when he's not working hard. But what I want to make sure is that he's going to have to work hard because I'm going to make the drill much more difficult for him. And so he's going to have to work much harder to, to beat everybody. And this is the thing is that make sure you're rewarding effort and hard work. Let me give you an example that I found works for me. Um, I don't like to have problems with the kids in my sessions. I like to be, I like them to like me. So when I see a kid not trying, you, you see it many times, they're, they're just not trying and they're, they're behaving not really very well. Instead of shouting, what I say is, okay, uh, Dario, do me a favor, okay, or oh, maybe, sorry, you stand up for a second. Okay, I say, look, I'm sorry, I'm not happy with your performance, so do me a favor, sit down for a minute, okay, sit down, okay. Now, when you're ready to give 100%, come back, okay. So now we, we're doing the drill, we're, we're keep going, okay. He's there, eventually, he says, put your, you go, yeah, okay, you want to come back? Okay, are you you're going to work hard? Come back, come on. So we, we didn't have a problem. But he knows I'm not going to accept 50%. But I also am not going to shout. But he gets a message, and then he is deciding he wants to work. And this is all the time making sure that once the players step into the office, the office, they work 100%. Out here, no problem joking. But here, 100%. Okay. When you give a task, you give a task. And then the player can't do the task. What's the problem? Let me give an example, okay? So, a player is volleying like this. All the time, backhand volley. Okay, so. Did I tell you I'm a very good coach? Did I tell you I'm very, very, I'm Dave Miley, you know that? I'm a very good coach, okay, so I go and I say, okay, see this? Try to be like this, okay, okay. So I've given the instruction, and now, I, could you throw me the ball? Just throw me, not, not, no, nice and easy, okay, so here you go. And now, I'm still like this, okay? So, I've given the instruction, but now I'm still, the player is still like this. So, first question is, do they understand what they have to do? So I've shown them, look, okay, now do they understand? I'm feeding, very simple. Show me without the ball. Do they understand? They understand? No. Show me without the ball. They understand. So no problem, they understand my instruction. Now, but when I feed the ball, it's like this. So maybe my feeding is too difficult. And now I have to feed a little easier, and then they can do the task. Okay? Because they understand, but maybe the feeding is too tough. Or sometimes players need more time. They understand the feeding's not too difficult, Give them a little bit more time. But the first one is, if they don't understand what to do, you're, they're lost. Who's to blame if they don't understand? You're so stupid. No. I'm the coach. I need to explain in a better way. If they don't understand, it's my fault. Okay, so maybe I have to demonstrate, maybe I have to explain, etc. So. Rotation of players. Why is rotation of players very important? It's very simple. I want to ensure all of the players are playing approximately the same amount of tennis. It's not fair if the really good players are playing a lot and the not so good players are not playing enough. So we need to make sure the rotation, sometimes by time, sometimes by points, but you do the rotation to make sure players are playing the same amount. 
And I'll show this on the court later on. But this is the reason why rotation is very important. Uh, now, when we're giving instruction, we need to know that people learn in different ways. So some players learn by watching and imitating, so demonstration is very important. But some players learn in other ways. They learn by, people, by explaining. But for me, because of this, most people are learning by watching and imitating. You as a coach should be demonstrating more. And the big mistake coaches make is sometimes they say, OK, guys, we're going to have two players serving, one player returning, and I want you to do come in, you're going to play the volley. So you explain everything. But it's much easier to go, OK, guys, watch me, OK? I'm going to serve, I'm going to come in, I'm going to play the volley. Everybody see? OK. So demonstrating is a good way of making sure everything's OK. All right. I'm going to talk about this in my last presentation, so I'm not going to cover it here. Why do kids stop playing tennis? Why do kids stop playing tennis? Three reasons from all the research. First one is they're not having fun. What does fun mean? This is the problem, because we might think that fun means if the kid is able to play very well. But sometimes, fun for kids is they want to be with their friend. That's fun. The only reason they're coming to tennis is because they're with their friend. But maybe the stupid coach goes, OK, you go over here, and you go over here, and now you're not with your friend. And now you're not having fun. So making sure kids have you find a way to make sure the kids have fun. And of course, boys are a lot different to girls at a young age, so you have to be able to make sure the kids are having fun. The big reason they don't, they stop, is because they don't like the coach. And so we have to make sure they like you. And sometimes that means it's not about the tennis things. It's like saying, ooh, you got some new shoes. I like those shoes. Oh, how's, how's, how's your, your school going? That they realize you're interested in them. And of course, parental pressure is also a reason people give up. And I'm going to talk about uh, parent education in a minute. I've had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with Nick Volateri. Uh, he's come to our conferences many times. And um, look. The guy's 85 years old, and he's got such passion. I love that. But we were in I Italy together about a year and a half ago, and he did a, a session on the court. And at the end of his session, he said something very powerful. He said, OK, guys, look, most of the players are not going to be top players. But please. Never let a kid leave your session without feeling good about themselves. And it's, it's fantastic, because find something during the session that makes the kid feel good. And because they shouldn't be going away feeling destroyed. So I think it's, it's just so powerful. And he's positive. If you see Nick coaching, he's always, yes. He's very positive and positive reinforcement. So for me, how to be as a coach, is so important. It's not so much what you do, it's how you do it. So communication and anim animation. You saw Dario today, come on. So much passion, animation. The kids seem, need to know that you care. Use people's names. Show passion and energy. Maintain a positive learning environment. So of course, sometimes you have to tell people when they do it wrong, but try and be positive. You know, when they see something good, go in there and be positive. Uh, build independence. I don't like it when I see coaches, you know, they go like, you know, my player, they can't play if I'm not watching. Or parents, they can't play, you know. I, I'm just so good coach, they can't play. No, come on, your job is to make them independent. So you help them, and a good example, is let's say a player hits the ball late. They hit the ball late and it goes off here. 
Did I tell you Dave Miley is a good coach? I told you this. Good coach. Okay. So, I very good. Uh, Dario, you hit the ball late. Hit it more in front. So, I told Dario the problem. You hit it late. And I told him the solution. Hit it more in front next time. Dave Miley is a very smart coach. How much money? Instead, what's more effective is to say, okay, um, Dario, how did that, how was that backhand? And Dario says, I missed. Okay, Dario, where did the ball go? It went over there. Why did the ball go over there, Dario? Um, where was the racket pointing, Dario? Here. Dario, where should the racket have been? Here. Dario, what do you think you should do next time? Hit it more in front. Dario, you are so smart. Very good. Okay, now. Now, in the match, when Dario misses a backhand over here, what does he do? He drops the ball and corrects himself. This builds independence. This builds independence. Remember I told you I went to Sweden one time, to Bostad, to this training center? The coaches told me something fantastic. You might want to do this here. They said that once a week, the players come and the coaches come, and the coaches are there for the whole practice for two hours, but the coach cannot say anything. The coach is not allowed to speak. So now the players come, they do their own warm-up, they do their own drills, and the coaches have to stay. Watch. They said it's so hard because you see the players doing stupid things. They're not, they don't do a warm-up. They, they, do, they don't do any serve and return. But then the coach can, can, can help them and say, look, why? Because eventually the player is going to be at a futures or going to be at a junior ITF by themselves, and they have to be able to practice and warm up themselves. So building independence is a very important part of, of uh, coaching. Now, I hope people know Jim Lehrer. He's, he's not as, I'm sorry, but it wasn't, Jim Lehrer is one of the top sports psychologists, but he's not SpongeBob. I mean, SpongeBob was really important to me, but Jim Lehrer was quite famous, but it was okay. But SpongeBob, I thought, was more important for me to have a photo. But Jim Lehrer made a presentation last year and again, he emphasized this thing about not many players are going to be top players. Okay, not many. But what's the best part of tennis? Because a lot of parents say, oh my God, we spend so much money. We, we, we took the kids and, and now they're, they stopped playing. They're not, they're, they didn't become top 10 junior ITF. Okay, but what happened? The best, it's a great investment because tennis helps you to grow up. You learn to grow up. You have a bad call. You're match point up and you lose. You are, have match point down and you win. You learn a lot of things about life and that's the best part. Tennis helps you to grow up. And this is what we need to sell to the parents that it's not just about uh, just playing and winning. There's a lot of very positive things as well. And for me, if you haven't seen some of these things, I'm very proud. This was a, a book I wrote a long time ago. Um, on parenting, and then these tennis tens are just some things parents need to know. A lot of them don't know you're supposed to clap both players. A lot of them don't know about many things about the sports. You have to educate them. Of course, there's always going to be some psycho parents, and you've got to do the best you can, but sometimes it's because they haven't been educated. <coughs> okay, let's talk for 10 minutes about performance, and then I'm going to stop. Okay, how much have I got? 10 minutes? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so let's, I remember all those things I talked about, I'm going to show on the court later on, really in a, with, with real players. Um, okay, for me, in my experience, and I think actually this, the, the Canadian system, it's quite a, a structured system, and they're having a lot of success at the moment, Tennis Canada, both in participation and player training, but it's the long-term athlete development, and I think Hungary, you know this very well, the long-term uh, program. But basically, it's uh, you start in an active way, make sure the kids are playing in a very active way, 
They have to learn the fundamentals. They have to learn good technique. They then have to develop their game. They've got to learn to play competitively to perform. They eventually learn to be you know, good junior ITF players, hopefully play junior, play on the pro circuit. But there's also this thing of you want them to love the sport. So whether they go on to continue to be top players, that they actually love the sport and they want to continue. What I hate about tennis at the moment is that many players who are playing very seriously, so they're 15, 16 year old, and they're playing Tennis Europe or they're playing junior ITF, and at some moment they realize they're not gonna be a top 100 junior player and they're not gonna play junior Grand Slam, they stop playing, they stop playing. I mean, that's terrible because I thought they liked tennis. If you like tennis, you want to keep playing, even if you're not going to be a top player. So this whole concept of making people love the sport, but also we have to provide opportunities for the players to play on a national basis, on a club basis, that they're motivated to keep playing the game. I'm not going to go into this in detail other than to say in all of the ITF books, there's a lot of very good information about what you should be doing at the different ages, between six and eight, nine and 10, 11 and 12, in terms of physical and coordination, tactical, technical, et cetera. And it's in all the books, okay? But for me, I think is if you're gonna work with performance players, you need to know what you should be doing at the different ages. It's, there's no fixed rule, but it's good to know approximately when a player is more likely to be able to develop good technique and when is a good time to work on physical conditioning. For me, the slower balls are very important. So the slower balls, um, red, orange, green, has made a big difference in terms of the technique. You see a lot less players with very extreme grips, and they're able to implement more variations in, uh, in play. I just want to show you one thing that may maybe you've seen before, but maybe not, which the French are doing. And you can, you can get this on, on their, their website if you want. But I, I think it's quite nice. What it's showing is that they've got this new white ball, ball blanc. And what you can see is that instead of kids pushing a ball like this, they can actually hit the ball and use more shoulder rotation. And again, it is serve rally score. They can hit the ball and they can keep score, but they're using their body more. The other thing I would say is if you, Tennis Australia, have a fantastic app, and it has videos of all of the red, orange, green, all of the technique, you can see the videos, and you can compare your player with their players, and it's only $6. You can download it from the website, it's fantastic. So if you don't have this, you can get it on your phone, but it's very good for the 10 and under and for knowing about uh, performance. Okay, now in terms of <laughs> developing <coughs> implementing advanced tactics. These are eight-year-old players, eight-year-old players from Belgium. It's an old video, but you'll see that these players can implement very advanced tactics because they're using orange ball. And there's no way they would be able to implement this type of tactic with a normal ball. Look at the racket speed, look at their positioning on the court. And it's just, you can do much more. So, of course, 
if the coach is feeding the ball, then the players can do all of these things. But with a yellow ball, they would not be able to do this if they were playing with other players. And that's why the yellow, the orange and red balls are very, very good. Okay. Okay, so when you work with advanced players, and I'll show this, um, tactical training involves decision making. So if you're going to work in tactical training, there has to be decision making. And of course, the most open situation is a match. And I'll, I'm going to show some of these things later on. Okay, so for me, the problem when people are, are working with advanced players is that they do too much time on baseline game and not enough time on serve and return and approach and pass. And for me, especially on serve and return, and one of the things that I do, and I'm going to show it later on, is when you do baseline drills, so you have players that are playing baseline game, okay, playing points on the baseline, cross court, why not, instead of feed the ball, hit it back and play the point, why not they start with a second serve? The player hits a return and then they play the baseline game. It takes longer because the player has to go like this and they have to hit a second serve but can you imagine how many second serves and how many returns the player will play in one year? Probably thousands. Instead of playing this, they do this. Easy. So, but for me, it's one example, but we need to work on serve and return. And what I see happening is, in club training, okay, guys, oh, we got, we got 10 minutes. Okay, let's do a little serve, a little return. Okay, we're done, bye. No, sometimes why not do serve and return first and then do baseline game? And approach and pass, for me, the players can develop a lot at age 8, 9, 10, coming in, playing the, the, the volley. And I'll, I'll show later on. But the main principle is work on the five game situations. Serving, returning, approach, pass, baseline game. For me, live ball drills are very important. Yes, uh, basket drills, I, I like to use them, but for me, I like to see as you work with more performance players, less emphasis on basket drills and more emphasis on live ball drills where I start the first point and then the players are playing with other players. Because this way, if you have a group of four, one moment the player is playing against a player hitting very flat, and then they're playing with somebody hitting with topspin, so they have to adapt. And this is why I think group training can be very effective. Of course, individual training is fine, but I think I want to show later on group training with three or four players. Now, planning the competition. Once a player is 12, 13 years old, if they want to be a high performance player, they basically have to play between 80 and 100 good matches a year. It's kind of a, a, a rule. Okay, maybe 70 be okay, but... And what does a good match mean? What does a good match mean? It means where the result is in doubt. When you walk on the court, you're not sure whether you're going to win or not. If it's a match you're going to win love and love, it's not, a, it's not a good match. So, 80 to 100 matches, preferably on different surfaces, and where there's a two to one win-loss ratio. So for every three matches you play, you're winning two and losing one. So if you play five tournaments and you're losing all the matches, you maybe need to play a lower level event to win a few matches. If you're winning all the matches easily, maybe you play up an age group for a while and get matches, but this is important. And this is the most, for me, one of the most powerful questions. And I would encourage you to use it with your players. When they finish a match, whether they win or lose, not straight away, but an hour later or whatever, just ask them the question, if you played the match again, what would you do differently? It's a fantastic question. Because now the player has to think, you know, because. You know, Let's say Dario comes, I'm using Dario a lot. Okay, Dario, 
You don't ask, did you win? You say, how was the match? Oh, I lost. No, no, but how did you play? And then you say, oh, I, I was up the first set, and I, I, I was playing well, then I had a break point, I didn't attack. Okay, Dario, if you played the game again, what would you do differently? When I got the break point, instead of playing safe, I'm going to really try to attack. Very good. So Dario learned something from the match. So this question is a very powerful question, and I use it a lot with players. Just if you played the match again, what would you do differently? Two minutes. Okay, so this chart, I'm not going to go through it a lot, but at the ITF, we did a lot of research about where players need to be on the international ranking scene if they're going to be top players later on. And so this is the female chart. I'm happy to give it later on. But by the age of 15, so at the end, at the end of her 15th year, so now she's in her first year of 16s, she should be top 100 junior ITF. If she's going to be, a, if she's a real talent, that's where she should be. By the age of 18, they should be top 10 ITF and top 500 WTA. If they're, if they're, they're really going to be good. The boys, it's one year later. If they're going to be really good, usually by the age of 16, they're breaking top 100. And by the age of 18, they're top 20, and they're 1,000 ATP. They're in the 1,000s. That's the kind of ballpark figure. And if they achieve these ranking goals, they have about a 50% chance of being top 100. That's what the research shows. Because there's lots of variables. A player can get injured, they might not like to travel, etc. Now, this shows a little bit better that um, by the age of, this is junior ITF, so by the age of 16 the boys are top 100, the girls are top 50. Uh, here's the pros. So by the age of um, 18, the boy is top 1,000, top 500. By the age of 21, the man is top 350, 200, etc. Let's give an example. This is a guy, Radu Albot from Moldova. I, I followed his progress a lot because we helped him a lot when he was a junior, ITF did. But this was his journey. So have a look. Early on, he was, at 16, he wasn't making what he should be. He was 480 instead of top 100, but it was because he didn't have enough money to play the circuit, not because he wasn't talented. So by the age of 18, he was just right. He was 19 in the world, and he should have been, you know, top 20, so he's okay. Then, and he was 1038 in ATP. Then, 500 was the ranking goal, but he was 726, so he was a bit behind. 281, 200, but he wasn't far off. And now Radu is number 60, 70 in the world. Another example. Uh, this is a girl from Tunisia, worked a lot with. You can see uh, this is Anjabur, very talented girl. She won Roland Garros when she was uh, 17, juniors. Um, this was her journey. So we knew she was very good because by the age of 15, she was top 100. By the age of 16, she was in the top 50, 14 in the world. By 17, she was number four in the world. And then she was focusing on a WTA. She was, the ranking goal was 500, but she was already ahead of that. So now she actually got to the final of St. Petersburg. She's now ranked, I think, 54 WTA. So, um, Okay, so just one observation I want to sh share with you. I get to see a lot of the juniors, top junior players, um, and I, I like to watch for trends. And for me, the big trend in the juniors is that the girls are serving so much better. They're, they're serving like, it used to be only Serena and probably Stozer could really make the ball break to the backhand, and, and, and most of the serves, they broke to the forehand. Ostapenko, it, it's breaking all the time. The second serve, it's quite weak. But the players now, they're, they're really using their body, and they're moving the ball much more. This is the girl who won Junior Wimbledon uh, from Poland, and 
Okay, it's not a fantastic clip, but you'll get the idea. The way she's using her body much more in her legs and driving, and it's really very powerful stuff. Very powerful. And there, it's not just her, there's like seven or eight of the junior players are really hitting serves with very high quality. Okay, last, last slide, and we're done. So for me, at the performance level, the quality and intensity in practice is what's important. So when they step into the office, I want to see high quality, high intensity, and replicating the intensity of a match. Um, and every day the players are trying to improve. So I want to show the last clip. I hope they can put the sound really loud um, for this last clip, okay? So Rafa Nadal, when he was number one in the world in 2010, at Roland Garros they gave him the World Champions Trophy. And I was at the dinner and we recorded what he ha had to say. And the person who was interviewing asked him a question. He said, Rafa, what motivates you to keep playing? You've won 10 Grand Slams, you're number one in the world twice. What motivates you? And, and this was uh, Rafa's answer. What remains to be done in your career? Can you put what it up? What keeps the hunger going? The practice hard? Not so much. Play hard, you find yourself in big matches, and you're always the man. Okay, to so. What keeps you going? Rafa is asked. Every day. No, that's, okay. that's all. No, just enjoy every day. Try every day to be a better player, you know. Being a better player doesn't mean that you're going to win more. It's because win or lose, you know, depends sometimes on the different facts. But be a better player uh, is practice every day with the goal, with the no, you know, with knowing what you're going to practice, knowing what you want to do about your game and why you are practicing, why you are waking up every day and going to practice. No, and that's why, because I. I love the tennis, I love the sport, I love the competition, and I love the tennis in general. So that's why the, the goal and the thing who remains in my career is continuing playing tennis and continue enjoying this fantastic life. Okay, so let me just tell you what he said, okay? So he said, what motivates me? Every day I try to be a better player. Okay, and look at Rafa, he, he, he's improved all the time. Second thing he said was, being a better player doesn't mean I'm going to win more because I can't control the other player. So what was he saying? Performance versus outcome. I focus on the performance and the outcome takes care of itself. Other factors you can't control determine who wins and loses. I always have a goal in practice. Always I practice with a goal. I want to know why I'm practicing. Knowing what you want to practice, what you want to improve in your game, and why. I want to improve my serve because I want to be able to pull Federer out of the court. Then he says, I love tennis. I love the sport. I love the competition. Whether he wins or loses. I love tennis in general, and I just want to keep, continue playing this great game. That's what he said. And if we could encourage our players to be like this, just every day try to be a bit better. When you go on the court, try to improve your serve a little bit better today and tomorrow and the next day. And that's all. And then the outcome takes care of itself. All right? So thank you for your attention. I'm going to be showing a lot of this stuff on the court, but I hope you found the, the, the session interesting.